Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Poulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In the New Testament, the proclamation of the death of Christ is inextricably bound to the proclamation of his resurrection. Typical explanations of this link cheapen it by expounding on the psychology of hope as if the resurrection is proclaimed as an antidote for the emotional burden of the cross. On the contrary, the resurrection of Jesus Christ The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep is a biblical sign of the coming kingdom in which God will hold each of us to account for the crucifixion. You better believe they're late. Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 24 to 28. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 325 of the Bible as Literature podcast. Last week, we talked about Peter and the difficult position the proclamation of the crucifixion and the resurrection put him in. Because Peter, like any normal human being, wants to be on the winning side but the cross puts everyone on the losing side. The resurrection is equally burdensome because once Jesus informed Peter that it was the leaders of the religious community in Jerusalem that would be responsible for the execution of Jesus, that made the resurrection a threat to Peter's own community. We like to talk about how wonderful the resurrection is, but the fact of Scripture is that the resurrection heralds the coming judgment. When the Lord appears in glory, it is to judge the living and the dead, and you would not want to be party to his execution when he comes back. Here's the position you're in. You can say, okay, I'm going to bet on Jesus, and then he gets crucified, and you're like, shoot, I put my hope in the wrong one. And then when he gets resurrected, oh, well, I guess he was the right one. I was wrong. Or you say, I'm going to keep my chips on Jesus even though he's crucified, which also means you're wrong because according to any earthly measure of what a successful king is, Jesus is the opposite of that. So either way, you're betting on the wrong one. The resurrection proves that whatever you thought before about what a king was, about what the Son of God meant, you are wrong. The resurrection turns everything upside down. If the very destruction of the Messiah, of the king, of the one who comes in the name of the Lord is crucified and then resurrected, it doesn't make any earthly sense either way, either his resurrection or his crucifixion. And so you're stuck. Peter Maybe he's being honest, and maybe he realizes how wrong he is, but he won't accept how wrong he is. He doesn't want to be wrong. He wants to be right. And in front of Jesus, there is no right. There's only Jesus, and there's only his word. And this is a word that no one can embrace fully because it goes against any earthly wisdom, any human wisdom, any fleshly wisdom. The cross and the resurrection are linked. The resurrection is the accountability for the crucifixion. The resurrection is not a reward. So Peter wanted to stop the resurrection just as much as he wanted to stop the crucifixion. Why would you want someone whom you offended with execution to come back from the grave? If you execute someone or if your team in a conflict executes someone and that person comes back, there are consequences. The resurrection of Jesus manifests the dominion of God the Father 
over the living and the dead, over everything. That's why he wasn't worked up in a frenzy over false accusations against his son. He can annul the decree of a human court any day of the week. But if the human court offended God the Father in its judgment, the human court will pay a price, in this case, in the resurrection of his only begotten son. So let's hear the proclamation with the same level of honesty that Peter heard it when he tried to obstruct it. If we understand that the light of the gospel is trying to escape the temple on Pascha, there's a chance that we may recognize that we are the ones trying to shut it up and stomp it out. It's like the movie Cape Fear. The lawyer does everything he can to put the criminal in jail, but what's the one thing that makes the movie terrifying? It's when the one who was condemned gets out of jail. He's single-minded about the one who put him in jail. The one who betrayed him, the one who took away his freedom, is the one who has to be most afraid. It is natural for that movie to be terrifying. No one is rejoicing that the one who was in prison now has his freedom again. Once he gets out of jail, he's capable of anything. The challenge for Peter and for those of us hearing the Gospel of Matthew together on this podcast is, as the Lord commands in verse 23, to set our mind on God's interests and not man's. If we define the victory of the resurrection on human terms, we're going to desire a victory that is offensive to God. And then when we encounter God's victory, we receive it as a loss. So to the extent that you are struggling with this idea that the resurrection is the accountability for the cross, you are still viewing the resurrection through the lens of human eyes. You still want the resurrection to look and feel like the Easter bunny. But that's not how it works. The hope comes from the judgment. It's not about our superficial worldly enjoyment or happiness. It's about the hope that comes from the sledgehammer of God's wrath for the life of the world. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is why in the New Testament the cross and the resurrection are linked, because the accountability for the cross in the resurrection brings a judgment against us because we have not denied ourselves. If we don't deny ourselves, God will deny us. In the context of the Roman Empire, if you are taking up your cross, you've been arrested, you've been tried, you've been convicted, and now you are on your way to being executed. Your lifespan is between where you're standing now and the top of that hill. Not only do I need to die, Peter, you need to be ready to die immediately if you want to follow me. His own mind has to be such that he is ready to die now. Now. You don't think of your 401k when your death is at the top of that hill. You're only thinking about the regrets you have in life. So put yourself in that mindset immediately, immediately, and go do the right thing and go do your duty because there is no time left. I'll never forget my college days. I had a professor expound on the failure of Paul to correctly predict the timing of the second coming. But this is illiterate. The way Paul preaches the second coming is as being imminent. It's not about historical chronology and when it's actually going to happen. We're judged at every moment of every day by Scripture. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, and you must master it. How do you master sin? With a new master who can outsmart sin with wisdom so that sin can't ensnare you. Now, the immediacy of the judgment, this urgency, is given to put pressure on us for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. 
but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you set your mind on human things, the things that human beings want, you're going to waste time because you won't conduct yourself as though the judgment is imminent. You will plan for your retirement. And that doesn't work with wisdom. You think it's wise, and it's wise in a worldly way, but it's not wise in your confrontation with sin crouching at the door in Genesis. There's nothing like imminent death to put your priorities in order. If you want to follow him, you must pick up your cross, which means you must embrace your imminent death. If you're trying to save your life, guess what? The only way you can find any life is by embracing this duty that the gospel sets forth. Paul talks about what you do when there is no time left. All you can do is to follow the law of love. The only thing that prevents us from loving our neighbor is saying we don't have enough time or don't have enough money. If I give my food to this person, what am I going to eat tomorrow? And Jesus is challenging that. Well, who says you're going to live tomorrow? Give him the food now. How am I supposed to do this if I'm going to do this tomorrow? If you are assuming that you're living tomorrow, then you're not picking up your cross. You have time today, you have money today, you have food today, you give it to your neighbor because tomorrow you're dead. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? I just want to point out the irresponsible liberties that are taken in translation. The word that is translated sometimes as life and sometimes as soul is psihi. And the way to think of it is life. Once God takes away your breath, you die and return to the dust. So the only reason they switch gears and suddenly call it a soul is because it sounds nice in English theology. We love to talk about losing your soul and saving your soul. It's not your platonic soul that's being counted. Once again, translation is interpretation. That's why even if you don't read Greek, you must have a copy of the Greek text or an interlinear text or some way even to visually discern how words are being translated. Translation is interpretation and ideology. Translation has an agenda. The only agenda that matters is the agenda of the original writers. This translation turns a logical argument into a moral argument. I mean, it really changes the meaning here. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his life? If you gain everything, you're going to die anyway. So what are you saving it all for? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his life? How much are you going to get? Once you get all that stuff, is it going to lengthen your life? This is how different this verse is when you read it correctly. I mean, if you're saving your money, thinking that there's some way of lengthening your life, then you're inevitably going to be disappointed because it didn't help. Job's kids were all in good shape. They had everything they needed. And then, boom, they're dead. Time and time again in Scripture, God keeps pulling the rug out from people's feet when they think that they've secured themselves. There's nothing worse in God's eyes than people who think they've secured themselves. This is the whole problem with Hosea in the Book of the Twelve. The kings and the rich and the rulers think that they've somehow got their life locked in, but it's simply illogical. Everybody knows that no matter how much money you get, you can't lengthen your life. When your number comes up, your number comes up. If it doesn't happen to come up tonight, Thank God, tomorrow you can do your duty again. If you're keeping yourself from doing your duty today, then you're preventing yourself from loving your neighbor today because you're assuming you're living tomorrow. Guess what? Eventually the tomorrows run out. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. The resurrection is the accountability for the cross. And it's interesting here that he inserts now the title Son of Man. Again, Peter just opposed the proclamation of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And now Jesus is once again trying to explain it and to force Peter to set his mind 
on the words that the Father put in him to preach and not on human words and human wisdom. Because if he looks from the perspective of Jerusalem, he's going to be looking for a son of the gods like Caesar to conquer for his side in a fight. So the only way, once again, that Jesus can explain the resurrection is by emphasizing that he's Ben Adam. He is the shepherd king in Matthew. A Ben Adam who functions as the Messiah, but in a different way than the sons of the gods who sit upon the throne function, either in Jerusalem or Rome. Because the rulers of the religious institution in Jerusalem, like the rulers in Rome, want power for themselves. They want the throne. They want victory. They want to make Jerusalem great again, to make Rome first. How can you do that with an ordinary Ben Adam? The disciples were hearing what the people thought the Son of Man was. In fact, the Son of Man, the one who brings this teaching, is going to come in the glory of the Father, who is ultimately the king of this kingdom and the conqueror who's coming. Are they willing to turn upside down their assumptions of how Jesus is supposed to be? How willing are they to be wrong? How willing are they to assume that they're dying today? I knew a man one time who was the head of a men's shelter, He himself had been homeless before, and when he worked at the men's shelter, he continued to act like he was homeless. He still did not assume that he was going to have a roof over his head the next day. And as a result, when he got money, he was very generous because he didn't assume he needed it for rent. Now, in the world, we say this is irresponsible, but if you assume that you're going to die tomorrow, what are you saving it for? The reward is coming for those who follow according to the law that Jesus and John the Baptist and the prophets and Elijah and all the people the disciples mentioned above have been teaching. Truly, I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I remember as a child, as an altar boy, hearing this gospel proclaimed, more than once as a kid, and struggling with this teaching. How could it be that some of us standing here will not taste death until we see the Lord coming in power? As a child, it struck me that this teaching had been read over and over again for generations. Even then, I understood that there was something going on here. This is metaphor. This is a literary device. What's really going on? The minute God put the instruction in Peter to preach, the minute he heard it, the minute Jesus repeated it, each time Jesus explains it, he is facing the Son of Man coming in his kingdom because the kingdom is embodied in the proclamation of its law. The kingdom and the heavenly city are a reality in the text. Earlier on today's program, I explained how every second of your life is an encounter with the coming kingdom. Now, in the narrative arc of Matthew, obviously he's referring to the crucifixion as a plot element, meaning you're going to see the kingdom When you see me crucified, which is linked to the apostles being sent by the resurrected Lord. Being able to see the crucifixion, like you said, Father, as the death of the Son of God, the death of the Messiah, and not the death of a loser whom we put our chips on incorrectly. This is the secret. As we know from Isaiah, just because you have eyes doesn't mean you see, and just because you have ears doesn't mean you hear. Jesus has been preaching the coming of the kingdom this entire book, and he only started where John the Baptist had left off. So the entire book is filled with the teaching of the coming of the Son of Man in his kingdom. People like the Pharisees and the Sadducees see a guy who's a loudmouth. 
Peter also doesn't see Jesus as the Son of Man coming in his kingdom because he doesn't understand. And when Peter denies, and when all the disciples leave, they do not see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Only by embracing this teaching can you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. By hearing, by opening up your ears, you can see correctly. And that's how the gospel works. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.